Uh, Nikki, if you want to kind of tell us about yourself and you know the work that you do, and then AJ, you want to chime in right after, and then I'll just kind of pull questions as they come to my brain, and and we'll go from there. Okay. Well, I'm Nikki Nance. I teach at uh, Beacon College, but I've um, been in the mental health field for many years, um, and uh, I've been at Beacon College for 11 years. Now we're unique. We've uh, you know we're an accredited school. We have a number of majors. Um, and, uh, been there for 30 years, just doing our work and building and improving. AJ? Um, I came to the human services field a little bit later. I actually have my PhD in industrial organizational psychology. Um, I also teach at Beacon. I love it there. Um, I've been there for eight years. So Nikki and I have had the opportunity to work on many a research project together over the eight years that I've been there. Uh, before I came to Beacon, I used to teach at a much larger university in St. Louis. So it's a Division II school. It was really big. Like my average class size was humongous compared to what I get to do at Beacon. So, um, so that's one reason why I left you know, St. Louis to come to Florida to teach at Beacon. Um, and while I've been at Beacon, I have had the opportunity to really dive into the human services field um, because that's part of our department. So I've gotten to do lots of kind of, uh, well, teach some of the classes, obviously, but I've also got to do lots of community stuff and work with our students, help them find internships, that type of stuff. So it's a really growing field. It's really amazing. Yeah. And so both of you didn't come into your your profession and your vocation with human services in mind, right? Y'all kind of came to it kind of uh, like naturally um, through your work and your research. Yes, I was already teaching other places and um, a colleague suggested that um, I check out Beacon College. I really wasn't too interested in another adjunct teaching job. But um, when I got there, it was such appealing work and very challenging that I ended up staying. Yeah, um, like I said, I wasn't really exposed to human services until I started teaching at Beacon College. Um, prior to that, I had done lots of volunteer work and stuff like that, especially as an undergrad, because I was really interested in clinical psychology. So um, I did some volunteer work at like women's shelters and things like that. So I got a little exposure to the human services field, but I didn't really think about a career in that field um, until until later. Yeah, I definitely understand that, Jack. I was interested in psychology um, at the beginning, too, and the way that it was kind of taught was m very clinical. And so that was kind of a turnoff at first, but it did it helped me eventually find uh, a lot of use in human services when I moved to that school. So I've, I joke, I, I always, I never actually try to avoid psychology, but it's never on the top of my list. However, I always end up taking tons and tons of electives or courses or classes or what have you not in psychology because it is, you know, it is so relevant to serving other people. But y'all's work together and separately as well. And then uh, at Beacon College is on neurodivergence. Can y'all explain a little bit about um, what it means, I guess, by the book? And then also a little bit about each of your experiences with either people that have, you know, experienced it or, you know, in teaching it. Just give us kind of like a a view of your world and the research that you do. The challenge of the school is that in any classroom with many students who all have different, um, you know, like profiles that we're working with. So we may have students that have ADHD and some people with ASD, some with specific learning disabilities. There may be a few who are dyslexic and some other ones who have processing disorders. So the challenge is balancing all of that and teaching in a way that everybody in the room gets the information that they need, has the experiences that they need, and, and can um, you know, be assessed in some way that really reflects what they're getting from a class. A lot of our research has really focused on that specific thing. So what can we do in the classroom to engage our students more? What can we do in the classroom to really kind of hook them or bring them in, you know, that kind of stuff. But we also like to look at the big picture. So yeah, we know what we're supposed to do in the classroom, but what about outside the classroom? What about building a community for these students? So then that way they feel comfortable transitioning first into college, right? Because a lot of, for a lot of our students, this is a really big step. They're away from mom and dad. They're in this environment that's usually a lot bigger than their high schools were, even though we only have 400 to 450 students, um, 
it's a much bigger environment than what they're used to. So how can we get them to transition from being so dependent on mom and dad to, okay, now you're a freshman. What does that look like? What does it look like to progress from freshman, sophomore, junior? What does it look like to be a senior? And then one thing that we've really been working on lately is trying to get them to feel comfortable or a little bit more comfortable or at least feel ready to leave college and go on into the workforce. So what does that look like? What are their expectations? Those types of things we've really been looking into. And for the most part, we found we found that they're not super realistic with some of their expectations, but some of their expectations are kind of in line. Like over 50% of them don't necessarily expect to work full time after they graduate. They understand that sometimes in human services, getting a part-time job is, or an internship or something like that is really the way to go first after you graduate, as opposed to finding a full-time job that pays, you know, 50,000 a year. A lot of them realize that that's probably not going to happen right away. Um, but we do have some students who expect that after they leave college and they get into the workforce, that they're going to have all of these accommodations available to them. And it's like, well, not exactly, right? Your boss is still going to expect you to hit deadlines and you can't necessarily say, hey, I need an extension for that deadline because of my learning disability, right? So some cop or some um, supervisors and things like that won't necessarily be um, very understanding of that. So trying to get them to understand what it's like in the real world versus what it's been like at Beacon where they've had all of their accommodations. Yeah, because that understanding is just not part of that culture. And so that's a second side parallel job and work and, uh, and advocacy kind of route that has to be taken on um, wildest, you know, during that process, everyone that can relate or is involved or impacted by it um, copes, I suppose. Uh, do y'all have students that, you know, when, when they come to Beacon College, do they have a pretty good grip and understanding on whatever their learning, you know, disability might be or, you know, what they're dealing with? Or do you also have students maybe that are coming in with no real, maybe it's new to them, maybe it's they recently, did, you know, found out or, they were in the midst of at another college or, you know, on track to do something else when it became a barrier. I mean, what is the how how are the personalities of the students that you teach um, in their relationship to their neurodivergence? A, a lot of our students had a late diagnosis, um, you know, some in their adult time. So they struggled consistently until they were out of high school, went to college and just couldn't make it, you know, though it was clear that they were bright. So uh, I don't want to say a lot, but that would be some of them for sure. We always have students like that. We also have students who come in and had no idea or no idea what their learning um, difference, what it, you know, what it meant. Um, I teach a class where they actually explore that, their own, um, whatever their own difference is. And some of them say, I, I don't have a name for it. I had an IEP. It didn't really say what it was. And so actually we're going in and saying, okay, let's see what the issues are and you know what that diagnosis most looks like. And some of them are just uh, right then discovering a name for exactly what they have. That's pretty much been my experience too. Sometimes we have students come in, although they are um, less, <laughs> this happens less often, but sometimes they come in, they know everything about their LD, they know the accommodations that they need to have, they have been self-advocating. Um, but like I said, that's very rare. The majority of our time, our students maybe kind of know a little bit about it. Honestly, a lot of them aren't really interested in learning about it, um, other than to the point where, you know, well, this is, this is how it's been affecting me, but they're not necessarily interested in learning how to overcome those things or anything like that. Um, so, but that's part of a lot of our classes is getting them to understand their strengths and weaknesses and then use those strengths and weaknesses in order to um, succeed in the class. It sounds like y'all have students that are kind of, you know, naturally learning and being exposed to the different elements of their own personal experience. And, and that's wonderful, especially because you do have, you have created an environment and work in an environment where um, it's encouraged, that part is encouraged compared to any other place they might find themselves, um, public school, where this you, you, whether the they know or not. Yeah. yeah. This would be the right. opposite of most colleges where they have a disability department and the, um, you know, it's hard for them to access that department. The department doesn't do a lot for them, doesn't necessarily encourage them to go for more. In our school, we're, you know, if we see somebody that's struggling, we're looking, we're, we know we have that accommodation somewhere within that system. We're going to help them find that. So it's quite a really the opposite of, of what higher education is and certainly what most of them have experienced in public schools. 
um, just yesterday I was sitting in my office and one of our community um, organizers came in and was like, hey, was this student in your class today? And I was just like, no, she wasn't. And he's like, I got to go find her. Um, so he was tracking her down. And it was just that morning that they had reported that she was having a bad day. So he was already, you know, by early afternoon trying to find her and locate her and make sure that she was okay. That mobilization to like look after your students, you know, and because you wouldn't find that. I mean, I'll take two steps back. You go to the disability department at a public school. I don't know if a lot of them would have an understanding of besides the textbook of disabilities they've been given to quote unquote address or, you know, refer to. I'm not sure because I'm not knowledgeable in, in that, but my confidence is, is that someone with ADHD is not going to go to that department and say like, Hey, I have these, you know, um, challenges that I need to address in my classroom. A lot of them are left kind of on their own to kind of figure it out. You know, do I talk to a professor? Do I even tell anybody? Um, do I get a tutor? Like, what is it that I need? So it's uh, like, it's like a basic one sheet, one sheeted fit of how to address something that's, um, it, it varies, you know, it's diverse. It's not a bad thing. It's just, it's different. Everyone's got a different blueprint. Yeah. So with the work that you do, y'all have come together. You, you, you didn't come together to Beacon College, but it was at Beacon College, correct, that y'all met and began doing research together. Um, tell me a little bit about, I guess, maybe some of the research that brought you together and what it was on. And, and if you can, the kind of impacts that it does make or that you hope it makes. I think the first thing we worked on, Nikki, was the book chapter, right? Where we eat. Yes wrote a section of the chapter and then kind of put it together. Um, the book, Beacon, Depart Beacon College all came together and our, all of our faculty wrote a book on how to teach students with learning disabilities. Um, so our psychology department, we wrote a chapter on um, like attention in the classroom, memory in the classroom, behavioral problems in the classroom, mental health issues. So it was a lengthy chapter, um, but it covered all of those things. And then each person in our department kind of took on one of those topics as a, a writing point. I think that was our first project. And then after that, I think we started really doing some of the emerging adulthood stuff. And then we got into the mental health stuff during COVID and then our recent stuff with them um, phasing out of college. Yeah, I think we were, the school um, was really looking at uh, the interaction between parents and the school um, because a lot of them accommodation means just call mom and she'll do it for me. Uh, and so working with the parent, you know, so with that kind of enabling going on, we really can't move them forward. So working with the parents became important and they asked us if we could do something. So we did put together a program about emerging adulthood and um, uh, AJ did the, the stats for um, people who really aren't actually emerging. They're just aging. Um, they're not really getting out into adulthood. It's, you know, it's, it's a brand new category of development anyway um, that, we, that oh, has cool. to yeah. So, you know, there's a focus on emerging adulthood. Um, you know, I've heard somebody say it used to be you were just an adolescent and then you were an adult at 18. Um, and, you know, that is no longer that up to age 34, between 24 and 34 or, you know, years of emerging adulthood. So the expectations are, are different. How they function is different. Um, the changes that occurred during that time period. AJ is really good at ferreting out uh, the, the compelling statistics that you look at them and say, oh, no wonder. You know? Well, I just scare them a little bit. <laughs> yeah. the parents know, like, if you're not supportive of your child now, they're going to be living at home for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a daunting thing to read. You're like, oh, okay, read the rest I of this mean, book. <laughs> right? The statistics are pretty sad and depressing when you look at how many people are living at home with their parents still you know specifically millennials and then now gen z like so many people are having to live at home there are more people living with their parents than living with friends or partners um so and when i tell the parents that they're just like oh no i really do not want that to happen <laughs> so right you know, a lot of it's educating them. Like these are the changes that your son or daughter are experiencing. They're on their own now in their own eyes. So they're going to want more freedoms. And then we kind of talk to them a little bit about how they can go about giving their son or daughter more freedom and how you tie that to more expectations at home and all that good stuff. And overall, I mean, it's been really well received. They've asked us semester after semester to please come and talk to the parents. So apparently it's working. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I can, I can see 
the confusion or I guess the, the lack of understanding is kind of like the biggest barrier. And that, that goes with everything, you know, but um, with learning something new about yourself, right? It takes not just you understanding it, but those around you understanding it. Um, because, you know, you have family, you have a network, you have the people that you rely on, that rely on you, especially. And so the the parent angle is so beneficial to not just the parents, but also obviously the students and their and their children as well, because then they're not having to do the whole, the whole, you know, discovery or rediscovery of themselves and how to function in, in their lives and reach the goals by themselves, right? I'm glad that you, you said it as a, an extra layer because there's such a fine line between continuing to learn about it and organizing your life around it. You know, it's a, it's an additional layer. It's not the center point. It's just a thing that needs to be incorporated with a lot of other things that have to do with how you look and your physical health and where do you live and what are you interested in, all those things. You know, and it folds into all of that. Um, and for so many of them, their whole life has been organized around their difference. You know, it's hard to undo that. It's like um, undoing a Jenga and trying to put it back the same way again. You know, it's just not doable. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and having to retrieve, um, I guess, in a therapeutic sense, having to retrieve those times where they had a perspective of themselves or what they're doing in any given moment in their lives and readjust with a new framework of like, OK, so that's how this that's why or how the situation turned out the way it was. Um, and then applying that, you know, what's great about it being the center at Beacon College, too, is that it is a learning environment at its core anyways, right? And so they are gaining these skills. They're doing everything that, you know, that the the, reg the regular world isn't gonna teach them from the get-go, right? Have y'all imagined that before? Like what it would look like for y'all's work to be incorporated into other public schools or just other, you know, institutions as a whole? We, we do um, education, you know, like professional development for other schools. They are interested. They wanna know how to do those accommodations. So a lot of times they're looking for that. So um, I think out of our admissions department, um, they put together um, programs every year so that people from, you know, from disability departments of other colleges can come and learn some of the things that we do. Most of the time when you think about college, you think, oh, there's a professor at the front, right? And they just talk the whole time. Well, you can't necessarily do that when you have a room full of people who have ADHD, autism, you know, specific learning disabilities. You, you can't just sit up there and talk for, you know, an hour or two hours. That's terrible. So just as a professor, like learning how to undo that, right? Because that's how we have been taught how to teach. So understanding that that's not the best way to teach. And in fact, it's not the best way for people to learn, not just people with learning disabilities, but for anybody. It's not a good way for anybody to learn, to sit there and just listen to somebody lecture at them for two hours. Um, it really, the best way for most of us to learn is to get in there, right? Get our hands dirty and do stuff. And that's really what we try to focus on in the classroom. And, and like I said before, one of the best ways to do that is really to make sure that your classes don't get too big or overwhelming. And unfortunately, a lot of administrations and a lot of boards don't really understand that. Uh, they think, you know, pack those students in those classrooms. The more students we have, the more tuition we're making. And it's right. really unfortunate. And luckily, we're not dependent. I mean, we're dependent on tuition, don't get me wrong. But we have so many other avenues that we're working on to help develop students before they even get to college. And that helps us in a lot of ways. Yeah, for sure. Nikki, did you just last something? week we did a I was going to say just last week we did a presentation for another college with parents like, you know, they thought that um, so that they were already making plans for what they were you know, before an hour after the an hour after we were done. They said, this is what we're going to do. Already making plans for that. So, to, you know, just get that other piece in place. So um, yeah, uh, there's just so there's so many angles to the whole thing. So for a regular disability department to just take everything on all at once, you know, um, and then and then what do you do with your faculty? You know, this is what we're gonna do with these students, but what are we gonna do with the faculty? We're gonna tell everybody to yeah. teach differently. The fact is, if they would, they would do better with every student. We know that public schools teach the way the least people learn. So <laughs> there's no reason for us to carry that tradition into community college, um, you know. But and <laughs> honestly, it's a lot more pleasant teaching the hands-on way. 
Definitely. Yeah, you're really involved in the teaching. It, it, you know, there's a, there's skills that you want people to have, um, and it's fun to watch them develop those, and it's fun to teach those as opposed to just um, slapping out information on a PowerPoint screen. Yeah, sometimes honestly, it's taken me a long time to get here, but sometimes I feel like less is more when it comes to teaching information. Instead of shoving content down their throat just over and over and over again every day, um, just focus on the, the basics and really make sure that they grasp that um, and feed that to them in a way that they can really understand and apply it to themselves and remember it deeply. So that is more yeah. important than, okay, by the end of the semester, they have to know everything about all of these different topics. Otherwise I failed as a professor. Um, but instead, if they can walk away, like Nikki said, with just a development of those skills that we've been working on, their writing skills, their presentation skills, their communication skills, if we see progress there, then it's worth it. Because that's really what they're going to use when they go out into the real world, right? They're not going to be like, oh, I remember this one experiment that I learned in gen psych. That's probably not even really relevant, right? Um, yeah. Just Google that to find that information. Uh, but really, we need to develop those interpersonal skills, those you know skills that they're going to use on the job. You said less is more, right? The first thing that popped in my head is the student in the classroom that says, no, 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 no. I need you to tell me what I'm doing every week. What you expect, is it a five paragraph essay? Do you, you know what I'm saying? It's taught that that's the only way to succeed when you are earning your education, right? That the way you're gonna go about this process of learning is you're going to do this, 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 and this. And if you don't check off these boxes, you're not going to, you're not going to pass. And then that becomes not only a responsibility of the professor as well, but totally negates the entire purpose of whatever you're learning. You know, the less is more factor, I think is the way to replace that checkbox system, right? You're going to go into this university. You're going to learn a lot of stuff, hopefully stuff you're interested in. You might change your mind but you're not going to be spoon fed and expected to do it in this box. And I think less students would be afraid of having their own freedom. Funny. They'd be less afraid to having their own freedom and learning. And so do y'all, is that a priority as far as at Beacon College? You know, obviously there are objectives to everything, but these students have kind of the, the freedom to not only learn it the way they want to, but um, at their own pace. Absolutely, at their own pace, but um, but not at their own pace so that um, uh, they get to have a lot of incomplete classes that they have to finish. In fact, that rarely happens, uh, that, that there's an incomplete right. because they didn't do one, two, three, four, and five. Um, so, you know, how we grade would be different. I've, I have assignments I think a lot of uh, professors do where there are options on how you present what you've learned. Um, I, I really bring... To students' attention at the beginning of many classes, they, you know, like I worry when you when your only questions to me are about how many points, how many words, you know, that the, um, if you can, you know, if you can show me that you're brilliant on this in ten words, that will work. If you talk to me in a thousand words and you haven't said a thing, that won't work. Um, so uh, <laughs> it makes you celebrate something. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And that's addressed right away. It, um, I just don't want to, um, I guess I look at how we've been taught and in fairness to the educational system, things changed. Like the only way we knew to teach, we had a limitation. We didn't have Google. We didn't have an electronic DSM-5. We didn't have a lot of things. So you really had to know a lot if you were going to be working with people to get a diagnosis. You really did have to, to, uh, to know things or what's out in the community. Now what's out in the community changes every three days and you can look at it every third day and say, what is it today? So why would we teach it the old way? The other thing is I think a lot of us learned, um, here's a topic, here are all the theories about the topic and here's some examples of those theories. I think we, you know, for myself, my teaching is more, here's a, here's, um, a phenomenon or here's an example, or here's something that happens um, and let's dig into that and say all the details of it. And then as we're digging into those details to say, you know, theoretically, some people believe this about that. So they're already, the buy-in is there. They're engaged with the it that we're talking about and um, not, you know, and then they're going to understand the theory. So it's not, you know, I know we have such a big fuss about doing, you know, like top-down learning, but sometimes, um, you know, starting with a small thing and working, working up to the larger concepts works much better. You know, that's what sticks with them. And the things that they refer back to, and that's part of that developmental model. When I get to 
um, a 4,000 level class, I have students who say, oh yeah, you mentioned a case when we were in this class that, uh, that this applies to. And they can say that, you know, they can cite that case then informally and say that, is that the same as this? Um, so we want them to make those connections. Part two of our conversation will premiere in two weeks on March 7th. In the meantime, listen, like, and share this episode and others over on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast.